Welcome to the Sample Chapter Podcast, the show where authors read a sample chapter from one of their books. Here's your host, Jason A. Meiske. Hello, my friends. Welcome back. You have found us for episode 23 of the Sample Chapter Podcast. My name is Jason A. Meiske. I'm a thriller author and, as always, your host, week in and week out, bringing you yet again another fantastic author with another amazing chapter to be read. Sample chapter, if you will. <laughs> you know, I, I wanted to uh, had something come up this past week, and I thought I'd go ahead and just take a minute. I, I've said many times, if you want to come on the show, if you know someone that you'd like to have come on the show, reach out to me. Okay, and I guess maybe I don't do a, do this enough, but how do you reach out to me? Well, you can reach out to us through our email at samplechapterpodcast at gmail.com, or you can hop on over to the our Facebook page at facebook.com, samplechapterpodcast. Uh, like us there, and you can send us a message, and I will get back to you on that as well. Uh, I am working on some other oh, little things here and there. Um, we may have a new website coming in our future, and maybe a little uh, plug-in for automated scheduling, that kind of stuff. Uh, tinkering with all sorts of things here lately, but uh, you know that's that's coming in the future. It's not ready yet, so but we'll see. If I if I definitely if I know something or if I get something set up, I will certainly pass it on to you as, as quick as I can. But back to the uh, the point of this was that, yeah, if you are a published author, I would love to talk to you. I'd love to have you on. If you have a friend that has written a book, I would ha- be happy to speak with them as well. So reach out to us, contact me, let me know that you're interested, and we will set something up. All right? Awesome. I would be remiss if I didn't once again mention that I do have my first author event, uh, my first personal author event coming up. July 7th, it's a Saturday, from 2 to 4 at Reader's World in Warrensburg. I will be there signing, autographing copies of Nine Mile Bridge, my first book. Uh, But, you know, I'll also be there. If you know me from the show, make sure you come on by and we can talk about the show. We can talk about your favorite episodes. Uh, You know, we can talk about my book. (laughs) Uh, You know, anything that you'd like. Come on by. I would just love to see you uh, if you can make, make some time. I'll probably be there a little bit early, and I'll probably hang out a little bit later. But, uh, yeah, that is 2 to 4 on Saturday, July 7th at Reader's World in Warrensburg. So look us up um, on my author page, author Jason A. Meiske. I've got an event page over there, and you can find it, and make sure to uh, let me know that you're coming. We need to go ahead and thank our sponsors. First one up is you Store All of Warrensburg, Missouri. You Store All is the absolute premier place for self-storage in the Johnson County area. They have non-climate control and climate control both. Their climate control is not just, you know, it's not just an air conditioner. We're talking full air conditioning, heating, dehumidification, which, you know, how many places can say they have humidity levels, you know, could be in controlled in there. That is a big old key, especially here in Missouri. I uh, got to keep that humidity away from your antiques away from your family photo albums all that kind of stuff Uh, the entire facility is fenced in it's gated access with more than 40 cameras recording 24 hours a day make sure to check them out at ustoral.net that is the letter u s t o r a l l dot net i also want to thank podcast garden they are our host site for our show and many many others like us they have a wide variety of other podcasts, uh, from fanboys to religion to just guys sitting in their basement talking about stuff. Um, you know, I was looking through the other day. There's people talking music. There's there's actual musicians doing stuff like that. There's all kinds of cool podcasts on there. So make sure you check them out at podcastgarden.com. And if you have an interest in starting your own show. You can do that on Podcast Garden for free, so check it out. Let me know. If you if you have started your own show, let me know. I'll be sure and give you a listen. Well, hey, this week's guest, <laughs> something that stands out uh, certainly would be the audio. Well, let me start from the beginning. This week's guest is alternate history and space opera author James L. Young. Now, what makes him unique to our show is that 
he is actually our last show that we recorded or have a recording of on our old system. Uh, fortunately, since then, I've been able to, I've learned how to use this Audacity program and I was able to clean up a lot of the audio and get some things done. But yeah, this is, uh, we recorded this way back in early March and there was actually a big section in it where we were talking about blizzards and snow and ice that had come through the area. So I was able to pull that out. But I mean, we do talk about uh, the upcoming movie Han Solo. We, we talk about his old release date for his book. You know, we talk about a few things that kind of dates the episode a little bit, but it's fun still, you know. We recorded this back in early March. He had an original release date set for early June, I believe was the plan, and that date got pushed back. He was hoping to have the uh, pre-release, the pre-order, I guess, all set uh, for, uh, you know, March, late March, then April, May. And it kind of, you know, kept getting kicked down the road because of other things, because of editing and other stuff going on. But, uh, yeah, he finally, in this last week, uh, was finally able to put up the pre-orders. And uh, he's got a firm release date of uh, July 24th of his new book, Aries Red Sky, which is the book that we're going to hear from today. Uh, James is also a D&D Dungeon Master. So if you are in the Kansas City area, because he's actually over on in the Kansas side, if you're into D and D and you need a dungeon master, holy cow! I I follow him online on his Facebook page, and I get to see some of his maps and other things that he's got set up. And yeah, you are <laughs> you want to hook up with James? You are in for a wild ride if you make him your your dungeon master. Um, it, it was a fun talk. We had a really good time. Um, his cat came to visit while we were talking, came in and crawled across his shoulders and was up on him for a little bit. And his dogs were barking in the background. Uh, we had a, it was a lot of fun, but, uh, I, I can't wait. I think you're going to really enjoy the whole, uh, the whole episode. So, so let's get it on over to our interview with James Elliott. Welcome back, everybody. It's another episode of the Sample Chapter Podcast. Today, our guest is James L. Young. James, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Well, uh, tell the uh, tell the listeners a little bit about yourself. Who are you? Uh, what do you do? What do you, what do you like to write? So, my name is James Young. I uh, write uh, usually alternative history and space opera, military sci-fi. So if you were thinking about authors that I would be in the same uh, genre with, uh, not the same class, but the same genre, uh, Harry Turtledove, Robert Conroy for the alternate history, and for the space opera, David Weber, uh, usually is you know, David Drake are two names that I do get mentioned occasionally in uh, conjunction with. Very nice. And now are you a full-time author? No, I, I do have a day job. I uh, actually work for the U.S. government. So th th this is one of those things where I usually tell people, you know, anything you read in my book is the opinion of Mr. Young, not, you know, Mr. Young, the civilian employee of the government. Uh, I, I've, I've always had that caveat. You know, one of the funniest stories was uh, I asked a Jag once. I, I had a short story that we'll probably never see the light of day. But, it, you know, I had a topic that was somewhat controversial. I've never seen a, a lawyer go pale before. So I, I decided, yeah, that just needs to stay on the hard drive and you know, I'll have a file marked. When I'm dead, publish this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. So, uh, uh, yeah, Mr. Smith went to Washington. And <laughs> <happened>. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's set in the Middle East. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay, all right. Let's just say nuclear release occurs between two nations, and we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> all right. Well, we met a couple of years ago at the, uh, the Stealth Con here in, uh, here in Warrensburg, Missouri. And that was great. I got a chance to pick up Pandora's Memories and uh, became aware, uh, first time I met you, first time I got to be aware of your books, and you've got a real knack for alternate history. Now, how do you, how do you get into these details, and are, are you a history buff? You, you seem like you have a, like, almost like a doctorate in history or something. Funny you should mention that, actually. As of a couple of weeks ago, yes, I do have a doctorate in history. I, I just uh, completed all my requirements for my doctorate from Kansas State University in U.S. History. So uh, here pretty quick, uh, what's going to end up happening is, uh, you know, in May I get my uh, doctorate and we'll see what goes on from there. Wow. Okay. Now, and so now how do you determine those details then? What to include, what to not, what do you, at what point do you want to break apart into your fiction? 
So I, I try to include details where at the beginning there's there's a good grounding of okay if you've had basic history you probably know about you know, you know who Adolf Hitler is you know who Queen Elizabeth is you know who Joseph Stalin is and then I try to with, with the characters I try to select people who are everyday characters so you, you you see how things would affect someone who everyone remembers you know World War II is a good war and everything else but. At the time, not everybody's sure of that. You know, there, there, there's a significant isolationist movement in this country, and there are a lot of things that are done by the British, propaganda-wise, to sway that. Because in 1940, you have a United States who's very much like, oh, that seems like there's some great unpleasantness going over there. That's not our problem. Uh, by 1941, even before Pearl Harbor, you have American... Or there's gallops or there's surveys you can see where American pot or opinion is starting to change. People are starting to say, okay, yes, maybe this is something that we need to do. This is something that we need to get involved in. Uh, it's kind of horrible what those British are doing, or what the Germans, rather, excuse me, before you slip, <laughs> are doing those people, everything else. Yeah, okay, maybe this is, oh, wait, the Japanese did what? And that, that's kind of where I, I try to ground people in the, okay, here are the opinions, the thoughts, and processes of these characters who don't realize, have no idea that this is going, how this war is going to go. All right. Where do you come up with a, a character that's going to, or how do you develop a character that's going to interact with historical figures and, and, and uh, events? So I, I try to remain or try to be very steeped in how the historical figures react to things. I mean, there, in some cases, you know, there, I did a presentation for our local library once where I've said, even the expert's not going to know this detail, so just make it up. Uh, you know, there, there's a Japanese admiral, uh, Yamaguchi, who is the, one of the main characters in my book. And I was asking these two gentlemen, uh, they've written several books, you know, they wrote Shattered Sword, which is a, a history of Battle of Midway. They run the website Combined Fleet, which is basically, if you ever need to know anything about the Japanese Navy real quick, great place to go. They are literally the experts in their field, both the Japanese, everything else. I asked them this detail and they said, not only do we not know, but we don't think anyone's going to care. Uh, we know most of the experts in this field. No one is going to call you out on getting that detail wrong, if you're wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, most of the records got burned in 1945. He dies, you know, in, in the original timeline in 1942. Meh, make it up. <laughs> so I did. Well, that, that's really cool. Uh, now, then you've also got some sci-fi that uh, this is very space opera kind of stuff and adventures, uh, alien contact. What do you... What do you prefer writing, the space operas or the alternate history? Well, that's like asking a mother who their favorite child is, and I've not had enough whiskey to admit that, you know, the second one was an accident. Uh, no. <laughs> no, honestly, I like the alternate history better. Uh, it takes a little bit more research and work, though. And But, I mean, that's not to say I don't like the space opera. I mean, with the space opera, it's pretty much like, okay, you don't think that was how that would happen? Well, that's nifty. Tell you what. Build a time machine. Let's go to thirty fifty. You tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, yeah, just that sort of thing. Right. I, the alternate history, you always will have those people who are like, you know, we like to call them rivet counters, who are, no, 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 that's you can't do that with that aircraft. It wasn't fielded to this year, and you know, the, the, and, and going to this long diatribe where it's like, I feel you. I hate when people get history wrong. Pearl Harbor is still one of my least favorite movies. I mean, don't get me wrong, great special effects, but you want to see me twitch, that movie will make me twitch. <laughs> but on the other hand, no one's really going to care about whether, you know, my description I got, you know, for one of a different thing, five panels instead of six, because I got the wrong model of the, the aircraft. You know, that, that that's one of those, okay, yeah, you, you take critiques like that and you're like, all right, whatever, I got your 399, thanks. <laughs> Well, uh, now to, uh, something you've got, you, you've got a space opera coming on. That's a continuation of your other series. Is that right? Yes. It's uh, basically, it, it answers some of the questions. It's a prequel. So for everyone who's like, you know, I, I have you little concept. When's the sequel coming out? Well, the next book is coming out, but I'll freely admit that it's a prequel. I do have some characters who are touchstones, basically, to have continuation with the series. So, the, for example, the captain in my next series... Uh, or in the, in the first book, he's a lieutenant at this time in the, in the, in the uh, Confederation Navy. 
So you see things from his point of view as a junior officer. Mm. And there are a couple other junior officers who are involved in things that are going on that are characters or secondary characters in the uh, the next or in the original book. Ah, very cool. Okay. So you get to see them as young ones. <laughs> Hey, you know, that's that's a popular thing to do. I mean, you, you, what do you do with Star Trek? Well, let's start over. What about Star Wars? I want a young Han Solo. I am looking forward to Solo. There are people who are like, eh, I don't know. What's the target audience for this? I'm like, uh, the target audience is everybody who remembers the original series and kind of wondered, how do you end up in a cantina on my, you know, on Tatooine? Right. Yeah, I'm one of those who was like, oh, I don't know about this. But then I saw the first trailer and I thought, oh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think we can look at the first trailer and we can, you know, assume some things on um, people who may or may not make it because we've never heard of them again. <laughs> you know, as I, I, I'm, I'm sitting there looking at these characters and I'm like, mm, well, I, I, I don't, don't get me wrong, I like me some Carrie Fisher, but if uh, I got to have the Khaleesi or, you know, Princess Leia, I, I'm sticking with the Khaleesi. So obviously she's not going to make it through this movie. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh alright <laughs> that's great James where can people find you uh, I'm on Amazon I, I'm also I have a couple of novellas uh, available on uh, Barnes and Noble Kobo uh, iTunes uh, my books are available through Create Space as well as Amazon uh, audio books are available on iTunes as well as uh, through Amazon so also available on Audible uh, you, you can do a search for uh, Unproven concept on CISO Crimson, Acts of War, Collision of the Damned, forget the audio books. And usually, I'm, I'm in a couple of libraries, so if you do an interlibrary loan and you try to find Acts of War, like a, I'm in the Mid-Continent Public Library System now, for those of you, your uh, listeners from the Warrensburg area, uh, where you can you can find stuff there. Uh, you, you can you know, do an inter- interlibrary loan that way, and uh, that's pretty much it. Nice. Okay. And do you? Uh, I think do you blog, or do you have a, a, a mail list? Yeah, I do blog. I also have a mail list. Uh, you can find the mail list through my blog. Uh, the blog is www.vergassy.com. That's vergassy.com. And uh, if you do basically, if you do a search for Colfax Den, uh, that that should bring it up because that's the blog name. And I'm also on Facebook. Same thing if you do a search for a Colfax Den, C-O-L-F-A-X, you know, D-E-N, Den like a, a Fox Den. Uh, that will also bring me up so you're able to find me. Fantastic. All right. So uh, now we know where to go and find James Young and uh, see what's coming next. Uh, James, what are, we, uh, what are we hearing today? So I'm going to read five pages from my book, uh, Aries Red Sky. Uh, it should be out by the end of June. Uh, you know, I've got the cover and everything. First 254 pages are uh, with the editor, and I'm not paying her for 500 so I can save, you know, the first half of the book, and then some is with the editor. Uh, the This is, you know, the prequel I mentioned. Uh, the section I'm reading from is you've, what you have here is you have two sets of humans. You have the Confederation of Man, which is based on Earth, and has the law that says any humanity must be sub- subjugated to the Confederation of Man. Point blank, no ifs, no ands, no buts. They have their reasons for that. On the flip side, you have a bunch of descendants of former dissidents, political refugees, and religious extremists who were exiled from Earth several centuries before. They basically call, they call themselves the Spartans, and reason being where they have realized that they had to raise a very much a militaristic society that was everything was geared towards when the folks from Earth show up, we're going to have to fight for our freedom and our lives. As I you know, explain, I, I liken it to imagine your craziest conspiracy theorist cousin. Imagine he had actually been roughed up by the authorities and then had been tossed into basically the equivalent of Australia. And then imagine they left Australia alone for like five centuries. You're probably going to have him not exactly be happy when someone shows up and says, uh, yeah, it's very good, Australia. You're now part of the government of man and, and we're going to take your whole continent over. Probably say something like, I've got this straight thing where I've, you know, uh, crossbred a, a kangaroo with a saltwater crocodile in here. Meet my friend. And that, that's basically, I mean, well, there, there, I, I guess I should, you know, do a little uh, expectation management. There are no crossbred kangaroo and saltwater crocodiles. It's not that kind of book. Oh, <laughs> darn it. <laughs> 
that. Now that I've said that, some listeners are going to be like, that's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> idea trademarked by James L. Young on the Sample Channel yep. podcast. Yep, yep. <laughs> I will sue you. I, I don't know how things will with Sharknado. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, James, thank you so much for coming on. I've had a wonderful time. Uh, can I get you to come back on sometime? Uh, yep, I will be happy to come back on. And now that the dissertation's over with, uh, I plan on trying to do two books a year. We'll see how that works out. Uh, you know, I also thought I'd have this book done by one mark. So, you know, weird things happen. I, there, there, there's been a lot of crazy. I will say that part of it is my own fault. I uh, run D&D as a dungeon master. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a homebrew. Uh, we're, we're, we're getting ready to move on a little bit. For those who know D&D, that's basically saying, eh, we follow the rules, but there's some other extraneous stuff. So that leads to some prep. But uh, eventually, someday, I hope to turn some of that into a fantasy novel. Oh. So, you know, of course, not the exact same characters, but different things with the setting and everything. So we'll see how that goes. But two books uh, may not be the same series. Uh, you, I may be back here with the post-apocalyptic series where... You know, it, it, people from your from your area, from Warrensburg, well, I, I originally grew up out just outside of Warrensburg. Uh, people from that area are going to be looking around like, oh, my God, he, he, he just, I know where that farm is. He just killed my cousin. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, that's fun. All right. Well, again, thank you so much for coming by. Oh, and, uh, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, James L. Young with his book, Aries Red Sky. So uh, to set the scene, we've had the first contact between the Spartans and the uh, the Terrans, which is what we call the Confederation of Man. Uh, what you've had happen is a, a Terran explorer ship came in, did a quick survey, went back out, and now has come back with a companion vessel. Uh, they they have been intercepted by the Spartans, and uh, basically some shots have been put across the bow. And the Terran vessel has decided uh, to go ahead and come about and kill her engines as she's been instructed to. So, uh, without further ado, Spartan Man of War, the Taken Umbridge, 0725 Space Fair Standard Time, Yankee 975 System. Good shooting, Ian, Commander Song said, clenching his fist in exultation. Thank you, sir, Lieutenant Ian Campbell replied, letting out a breath he didn't know he was holding. Reaching for it, he placed the Umbridge's weapons on standby. Okay, Helm, let's match velocity, Song ordered. Aye, aye, Ensign Maida Ravensbrook said from beside Ian. Like you, Bonnie, Ravensbrook's skin was a hunting golden under her face shield. That was about the extent of their resemblance, as Ravensbrook had been a prop for her kibitz's amateur rugby league. Sir, the leech reports contact two is escaping, the XO said over the Umbridge's internal communications. The disgust in her voice was quite evident. Ian looked briefly at the tactical map. He noted that the second enemy vessel's velocity vector was extending at a rapid rate, the wayward Leech's missiles not closing nearly fast enough. Bad hand, the Leech drew, Ian thought. Don't know if that was planned or not, but coming in and splitting up meant that he would have needed a shitload of luck to get both vessels. Painbringer, stand by, Song said, referring to the Umbridge's marine platoon. Lieutenant Ravensbrook signaled that enemy vessel to cut her velocity by 1,000 kilometers per second. Once she complies, bring us within 100 kilometers. Aye, aye, Maida said. Ian watched as Contact 2 entered hyperspace. That's not going to end well, he thought grimly. A few moments later, the wayward Leech's missile self-destructed. Ian watched as the other Spartan Covet killed her own velocity, the size of her signature telling him that the Leech was employing maximum deceleration. I'd probably turn the hell back around as well, Ian thought. Kind of far away from our cruisers, and who knows what Contact 2 will bring back. Lieutenant Campbell, Song said. Yes, sir, Ian asked, turning around. Report to the shuttle bay, Song said conversationally. It just occurred to me if we have a bunch of pain bringers unsupervised in a situation where translation is needed, they may speak in the language they know best. No need to paint the bulkheads if we don't have to. Ian's stomach clenched. I'm about to be among the first Spartans to lay eyes on Terran since the dysphoria, Ian thought. Holy shit. XO, this is Commander Song. Send me as Ensign Potter, have Midshipman Mendoza take over weapons at your location. Aye, aye, sir, Lieutenant Commander Gorman stated. Lieutenant Campbell has volunteered to go collect his prize firsthand, Song said with a smile. Ian looked at him as he unstrapped from his seat. Eubani is going to kick my ass for volunteering, he thought. Then he started as he realized the numerous assumptions that underlay that statement. Grateful that taking on Bridges' artificial gravity was engaged, 
He started to move towards the hatch at a brisk walk. Campbell, Commander Song called. Yes, Captain, Ian responded. Don't be afraid to paint the bulkheads either, Song said solemnly. Your primary responsibility is the safety of yourself and your praying bringers. Aye, aye, sir, Ian said with a nod. Song gestured for him to continue moving. Once Ian stepped off the bridge, he dashed down to take an umbrage to the central corridor. He could feel the Corvette decelerating as he ran towards the trunk that descended through the keel to the shuttle bay. Carved out of the Corvette's hull like a niche out of a tree trunk, the bay was dominated by a single Shuriken-class assault shuttle that was suspended over two large hatches. Reaching the bottom of the escape trunk, Ian dropped down to the catwalk over the smaller vessel, then walked around its curvature to where the shuttle's rear hatch was open. You, Campbell, the pain bringer standing in the hatch asked. The Marine was standing in light battle armor rather than a heavier version. A rail assault rifle clutched in his gauntlets. At least we won't look like malevolent insects when we step aboard the Terran vessel, Ian thought. Fundamentally a spacesuit reinforced with dense metal plates, light armor would allow the 40-man platoon Ian and plus Ian to fit in the back of the shuttle. Lieutenant Campbell, yes. You are? Ian saw the man stiffen. Lieutenant Donovan, sir, the Marine said, looking Ian up and down. Sir, shouldn't you be in armor? Platoon leader Donovan asked. No time, Ian replied. He stepped aboard the shuttle, shocked to see the pain bringers for bearing, breaching, and cutting charges. Is there something I'm missing? Ian asked, looking at his chronometer. The enemy vessel is surrendering and coming about. No, sir. The enemy vessel is complying with us right now, Donovan replied patiently. We get aboard, they may get it in their head they have hostages and can make a break for it, at which point we will convince them the error of their ways. Ian looked at the Marines, quickly and efficiently loading their kit. At the midpoint of the shuttle, one Marine was checking over his minigun. As the barrel spun briefly, Ian suppressed a shudder. Good point, Lieutenant Donovan, Ian said. Let's get this started. Lieutenant Campbell, Commander Song is asking if we are ready to deploy. The shuttle pilot shouted back through a few slots. Looking around, Ian found the communications panel and plugged his suit in. Sir, we're ready to go, Ian said, hoping his voice had more confidence than he felt. Very good, Ian, Song replied. Once you're aboard, bring that ship between the moon and the planet Fairfolk. Aye, aye, Captain, Ian said, starting to see the geometry in his head. At present, Fairfolk's moon was moving towards the opposite side of the planet from where Contact 2 had left the system. Both times the Terrans came in from that direction, Ian thought. If they do so again, we'll use the planet's sensor shadow. They'll have to come in to find us, and that means, well, that means they're going to find out what there's monsters out here in the stars. Take us out, Ian called to the shuttle pilot. Nodding, the man turned and pressed two buttons on his console. The first brought the shuttle's rear hatch closed with a whine. After the longest 30-second warning collapse Ian had ever experienced, the second opened the shuttle bay doors and engaged the repulsor liquid in the re shuttle's retaining cradle. With a drop like an elevator prominent plumbing down the side of a skyscraper, the shuriken shuttle was ejected from the taken umbrage's metal womb. Once sure he was clear, the shuttle pilot engaged the thrusters, taking the small craft towards the Terran vessel. On his display, Ian saw that their opposing craft was built even more like an old hot rod than he thought, the narrow hull appearing to be barely twice the shuttle's girth. Ten minutes to rendezvous, Lieutenant, the pilot said. Roger, Ian replied. In the end, the longest wait was finding a suitable hatch on the Terran's hull. Finally locating an airlock three-quarters of the way down the vessel's length, the shuttle pilot aligned his craft's rear hatch with the structure. Dialing up the communications array and selecting all frequencies, Ian took a deep breath as he tried to remember his Cantonese. Hostile vessel. You will open the airlock located on your starboard side, Ian said slowly, aware all the plane bringers were looking at him. You have five minutes to comply or we will breach your hull. There was no response, only silence. Bringing up a chronometer display on the inside of his helmet, Ian set the timer for four minutes. Turning, he pointed his finger and shared the timer with Lieutenant Donovan who in turn turned and shared it with the squad leader and platoon sergeant using the laser connections from their suits. Why four minutes, sir? One of the squad leaders asked. Because if you're going to blow a hole in someone's hull, you don't tell them exactly when you're going to do it, Sergeant Donovan snapped. Tends to ensure they have a surprise waiting for you. Ian nodded towards Campbell in agreement. Before the latter could say anything else, the hatch opposite them descended to reveal an inner airlock compartment. Ian started to step forward, only to have Sergeant Donovan stop him. Sir, we train this every day, the Marine said. If there is something waiting for us beyond that inner hatch, I'd rather not explain to Commander Song why one of his officers got sawed in half. First squad, with me. The first squad of Donovan's platoon moved past Ian to the hatchway. 
their mag boots clanking on the deck beneath their feet. At Donovan's signal, the 11 Marines quickly stepped through the, re- the Irish outer airlock hatch, weapons at the ready. Ian was about to transmit another command when the outer door suddenly Irish shut. What the fuck? Donovan's platoon sergeant shouted. The man turned a gesture for a demolition charge when Ian held up his hand. They've got to settle the airlock, Ian said, keeping his own voice calm. If it doesn't open in 10 minutes, we blast our way in forward. He could see the NCO wasn't keen on the idea. Not giving him a chance to protest, Ian turned back to face the hatch. Keep calm, Campbell, he thought. Trying to take his mind off what could be happening on the far side of the hatch, he studied the craft's hull. Whereas all Spartan vessels were painted gray and black, the Terran vessel was painted a dark silver all over. As he looked over the outer airlock hatch, he could see that there were three lines of lettering in glossy black. One he recognized as some Asian dialect, but not the Cantonese he was used to learning. The second he recognized as English, but not the same as the holographic documents suspended in the legislature's hall of citizens. Finally, the last looked to be Arabic. So intently was Ian studying it that the hatch irising open again caught him by surprise. They were once more confronted with an empty airlock, but this time Ian could see Donovan's helmeted face staring through the far hatch. He watched as the Marine officer held his hand up in front of his face, then flashed three fingers, two, then four. It's safe, sir, the platoon sergeant said beside him, relaxing only slightly. Ian nodded, then stepped from the shuttle ramp to the open hatch. He felt his mag boots bring him to the opposite deck, his suit indicating that artificial gravity was also present. I didn't catch your name, Sergeant, Ian stated, looking back at Donovan's platoon sergeant. Reese, sir. Sergeant First Class Reese. The rear hatch opened again. A soft his told Ian that the airlock was cycling. After a few minutes, the pressure equalized and the internal hatch opened. Ian started to step through, but had Sergeant Reese grab his wrist while second squad passed them. Confident that Donovan was not being held against his will, Reese let Ian go with an apologetic look. Do you really think I'd give it more? Donovan asked, using Reese's call sign as Ian stepped into the Terran vessel. Feeling the impact of the movement, he took a deep breath and began surveying the compartment. There are four Terrans, three women, men, and a woman all wearing dark gray coveralls at the far side of the compartment. The first squad of pain bringers had placed a force on their knees with their hands behind their head. Of the four, the women seemed the most calmest, with her male companions ranged from similarly stoic to the shorter genius Terran who had visibly wet himself. Two pain bringers stood behind them, their rail guns pointed down at the Terran's back. They better to make sure they don't catch any friendliness if they had to shoot, Ian thought. Holy shit, the Marines are like having an angry cry of a psychopath at one beck and call. Turning to his left, he saw that the airlock was controlled from a small panel near the stern bulkhead. Another woman, tall and willowy, stood at the panel with a pain bringer standing behind her. The Marine's vibroaxe was clenched in both hands, his gaze focused on the woman as she cycled the airlock once more. To his right, Ian saw that the Terran spacesuits were all stacked in a heap. Melee weapons so he doesn't put a round through the console, Ian thought. Space suits off so they'd be the first to die if there was any funny business with the hatch. Yep, psychopaths, but smart ones. Engine room or bridge first, Lieutenant, Donovan asked. I'll take Sergeant Reese to the bridge, Ian said. It's probably best that you and I aren't in the same place. Donovan gave Ian a grudging look of respect through his visor. I trust that if I should somehow have something happen to me, your revenge will be swift and terrible, Ian said with a smile. Lieutenant Donovan grinned back, and it was a look that made Ian want to run and hide. Tucker, Sue, with me, Reese barked. Reaching down to his waist, Reese released his holster from where it was clipped to his leg armor. Handing the pistol to Ian butt first, the NCO gave Ian a grim look. If it comes to it, sir, I'd prefer that you be something other than a target, Reese said. The hatch to the ship's interior suddenly irished open. Without a word, every Marine but those currently covering turns turned to cover the opening. I am leaping up, someone shouted from the doorway. Their Cantonese truly horrid. A moment later, a woman of about average height stepped into the hatch. Her hazel eyes were puffy, as if she'd been crying, and her brown bangs were plastered to her face from sweat. The woman looked around the room, her mouth pressing into a thin line as she took in the Terrans kneeling. Who are you? Ian asked, noting that the Marines did not shift from covering her. The woman looked at Ian, her eyes narrowing as if she was trying to understand him. Your name, Ian stated, keeping his voice calm so as not to get anyone shot or decapitated. What is your name? My name is Marcy Cochran, the woman said in broken Cantonese. I am the leader of this vessel. What other languages do you speak? Ian asked. I I speak English, she replied, perplexed. Do you not have translator chips? No, what I have are 40 Marines, Ian thought. 
We will have to stick with the Cantonese, Ian said. Take us to your bridge. Tell your personnel to remain at their stations. The woman nodded, then raised her arm slowly to her face. Speaking rapidly into the tablet on her wrist, she gave several sentences worth of commands. There's a problem with that hatch blocking all comms, Donovan muttered. Ian realized he was using the Taken Umbridge's internal command console, something only Ian, Donovan, and Sergeant Reese could hear. Agreed, Ian said, looking back at the airlock hatch. But we really have no choice in the matter unless you want to risk having the shuttle establish a direct seal. No, that's probably a very bad plan, sir, Donovan replied. My slaves remain in their rectangles, the Terran captain said. Ian looked at her, or fighting the urge to shake his head at the nonsense sentence. Lead us to your bridge, Ian replied, pointing to the hatch. Your forces are now under prisoner's covenant. The woman stiffened, not at once, and turned to leave. Behind him, Ian heard the hatch open as the last of the taken umbrages first marines stepped aboard the vessel. It's just begun, he thought. It's only just begun. And you've been listening to James L. Young reading from his new book, Aries Red Sky, coming out on July 24th. It is available right now for pre-order, so make sure you get yourself a copy. Hey, I'm going to have links to all of his all of his stuff uh, in the show notes, but uh, make sure you get it over on his Amazon. Uh, check out his Colfax Den. Uh, it's on Facebook and on that Vergassi website. Uh, make sure you're following him. You can get his emails. Make sure you give us a rating on wherever it is that you're listening to on iTunes or Google Play, any place that you're listening to us. We really, really appreciate this. And, uh, you know, we'll be back again next week with a new author, another book, and another sample chapter. Thanks for coming, guys. Bye.